Good morning, everybody. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Welcome you today to our, our service here at Family Worship Center on this uh, wonderful day. God has given us a beautiful day and great day for fellowship and a wonderful day to celebrate that Jesus is alive. Aren't you glad you have a, a living God instead of, praise God. Amen. So many in this world serve a memory or a dead God or God whose bones are still in the tomb. But we celebrate a living Jesus and our prayer today is that you'll experience him in, a, in just a wonderful way this morning. You'll sense him, sense his presence in this place and you'll leave here victorious because he's alive. He ain't dead no more, praise God. And so I want to just uh, encourage you to enter in. We don't want to warm you up today. We want you to be warmed up. And uh, we fed, fed you if you came early enough. And after we're finished this service, there's still some, uh, some food out there. You can just enjoy yourself again. But right now we're going to begin this service with uh, some wonderful music that lifts up the name of Jesus. And let me just ask the Lord to bless it. Shall we, Father? We come to you today with hearts full of thanksgiving and praise. And we pray you'll lift the heavy burdens that some may be carrying, that your presence will be special today, felt and, and will experience your life today, the life you've given us in Jesus Christ. Bless the singers and the players. Let your will be accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Good morning. Would you all stand? We're going to begin, uh, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to sing during this song, but Bob Diaz is going to tell us a story in, in song. Listen to this.
God. Aren't you glad he'd overcome? Amen. You may be seated. Wow. There was a one, a three-letter word when I passed by the Harleysville uh, hardware store this morning. It said, he is risen. Amen. Maranatha. Praise God.
This morning, my message entitled, Something is Happening in the Graveyard. Um, the uh, Crab family uh, wrote a song called Something's Going On in the Graveyard. It has to do with the, the uh, story in the Old Testament where Elijah, or Elisha's grave, Elisha was buried, and uh, a young man died, and for the sake of space, I guess, they, they laid his body on top of Elisha's in the grave, and, and uh, he came alive uh, from the power that was still in that prophet's body. And, and it's, a, it's a true story in the Old Testament. So something's going on in the graveyard. We found out for sure you can't keep a good man down. In Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 22 to 24, let me read it with you. Men of Israel, this by the way, day of Pentecost, Peter, the man who expressed or showed cowardice at the trial of Jesus, now is standing up and, and speaking to thousands of people the, the gospel. And here's what he preached. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he would be held by it. This is part of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. He, he, re, he referred later on, Paul referred, to the power of the resurrection. And we want to talk to you this morning about the power of the resurrection. It was not possible that he should be held by a grave. It was impossible. Peter's saying death could not hold him. And we've been singing about that all morning. Famous people die every day. I, I, I Googled that just to find out how many in 2015. And there's scores of well-known famous people that died in 2015. I'll read some of the names. Yogi Berra, Wayne Rogers, Maureen O'Hara. Frankie Ford, Jackie Collins, Moses Malone, David da Daryl Dawkins, Frank Gifford, Omar Sharif, Dick Van Patten, and many, many others. These, these people were famous people, and they died in 2015. And they'll be remembered for a little while, and then forgotten. But the death and resurrection of Jesus is remembered over 2,000 years later. We sing about it now. Why? Because he didn't stay dead. He rose again in power and glory. His resurrection is not a religious fact. It's a historical fact that Jesus rose from the grave. At the risk of their lives, his disciples, his followers, told the story until they were martyred or died a natural death, they told that story about the resurrection. Those who refused to believe in the resurrection couldn't understand why are they risking so much for a lie? See, they, they felt like it was a lie. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. But the power of the resurrection is more powerful than any ism or dynasty on this planet. I want you to hear that today. Most of my life, the country of Russia spoke of godlessness, atheism, bondage, death. A superpower that caused more heartache in history and death than any other power since the Roman Empire. This week, again, we saw graphically what isms can do, what a godless religion can do. Radical Islamic terrorism is rampant today, and it hit Brussels. Bev and I have been in that, that, that airport in Brussels twice. 
our team that went to Uganda a few months back, spent some time, hours, spent hours in the Brussels airport. It's a, a main hub of travel when you go through Europe to somewhere else. Brussels this is the seat of power for NATO. Brussels has been in history for a long time. I remember coming up as a kid in church that they talked about that how how critical Brussels, Belgium is going to be in the in the uh, term of the Antichrist, and we saw graphically horror, carnage by some religious people. In the name of their religion, they've done that. Now, it's understandable to me their brutality because of what they've been taught since they were children. But it's indescribable publicly to describe the, again, the carnage, the vicious ruining of human lives, serving a dead God. The bones of Muhammad are still in his grave. Jesus is alive. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul said this, the God of this world blinds the minds of those who won't believe, knowing that if the light of the gospel penetrates their hard mind and their blindness, they will see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There it is. Darkness can only be dispelled by light. The gospel of Jesus Christ is light. The resurrection power of Christ will resurrect life and hope. If you haven't experienced that, that you can today. Praise God. Faith and power can come into your life. Souls that for decades were bound by communism, by bondage to satanic cultures have been set free by seeing the light of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. There are many in this service that have experienced firsthand the power of his resurrection. If we had time today and asked you to give testimony, there's probably hundred in here or more that have been delivered from alcohol or drugs or pornography or some kind of a bondage that Satan puts on people. In this service today, you've experienced the power of the resurrection. Had it not been for Christ, had it not been for Calvary and the empty grave, you would be lost and hopeless. I'm glad we have hope today. Hallelujah. It's terrible to be hopeless. But we have a hope beyond the grave. Many of our young people today are looking at a life and compare, and they feel like they're hopeless. And that's why there's such an epidemic of drugs and suicide and different kind of forms of punishing themselves because they think life is hopeless. But I'm telling you today, there's hope in Jesus Christ. What hell tried to do to Jesus, Jesus did to Satan's kingdom. Praise God. This week, we had the privilege of uh, traveling with the senior saints, the Oasis group. That's the that's new name for our teenagers, Oasis. Older saints still in service. Oh, oh, hey, that's right. I should learn how to spell. Older adults still in service. That's Oasis. And we went with them. I don't know how we didn't, we passed the, the age test, I guess. But I said to Ben, what are we doing with a busload of old people? I mean, come on. Just kidding. We were probably a couple of maybe the oldest there. But we, we went to Sight and Sound and we saw, that's an awesome place, isn't it? And we saw the, uh, the play about Samson, just called Samson. And once again, 
we saw how Satan does not learn from history. Samson's a great story in the Word of God. Uh, but in Judges chapter 16, let me show you what uh, the Word of God says. It happened when their hearts were merry, they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison. He performed for them and they stationed him between the pillars. Now the temple was full of men and women and the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. And Samson called to the Lord and he said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray, and strengthen me, I pray, just this once. O oh God, that I may be with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Satan's plan backfired big time. The plan that he had for Israel. And the champion of Israel, of course, was Samson. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. No matter what the Supreme Court says, or Congress, or politicians, or atheists, or agnostics, God is not mocked. It happened again in the book of Esther. Remember the book of Esther? When Haman was hung, hanged on his own gallows because he tried to destroy God's people. It also happened, you, you don't mock God and win. Let me give you another example. This is the book of Daniel, chapter 5. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and they drank wine in the presence of the thousands and while he tasted the wine Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem and the king and his lords his wives his concubines might drink from them then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and rode opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote, and the king's countenance changed. His thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. Belshazzar was so scared that his knees knocked. You do not mock God and win. And history has proven it over and over again. In Revelation, there's another powerful ex uh, example of, of Satan's power being uh, destroyed by God's power. Revelation 11, 12, and 13. Two beasts are prowling. Blasphemies are recorded every place where the Antichrist and his false prophet are causing havoc. It's in the word of God. And above all the confusion, of all the destruction that was happening in the Revelation, there's a heavenly song. There's music. Jesus made his appearance at the time that Satan reached his pinnacle of power. The all-powerful one came. And I'll read it to you in a moment. When the false prophet is allowed to give life to the image of the beast, it's Daniel's prophecy being fulfilled which is called the abomination of desolation, the ultimate blasphemy, the filth of hell appears in the temple and those with the mark of the beast worship him. This is future. This is the, the revelation of John the Baptist or the revelation of Jesus Christ written by John the Beloved. Mocking God, belittling God, and then the Bible says, suddenly, let me read it to you. I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion 
with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of, a, of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. This is another uh, exposure of Satan's weakness. Let me just give you a little an aside here. Can I do that? <laughs> I don't know if any of you have, have Jehovah's Witness background or you are practicing in that, in that uh, religion, but we used to get a lot of visits to our house from the Watchtower Society. They'd, you, how many have ever had a visit from the Watchtowers? Yeah. They're very busy about, their, their, the, about their, their commitment, their calling. And the last time we had a visit was quite a while ago. These two young ladies, one older than the other, but young, came to the door. And uh, I asked them to come in. They wouldn't. I asked them if I could pray for them. They wouldn't let me. And they asked me if I was concerned about the future. And I said... No, I'm not. You're not? I said, no, not at all. I said, I, my future is with Jesus in heaven. No matter what happens on earth, that's my future. And they said, that's impossible. Don't tell me that. No, they said, it's impossible. You have to know a certain song. I just read it to you. They have to know a, a certain, nobody could learn that song except the 144,000. You have to know a certain song, and that's already been filled. And they mentioned a year, 1935 or something like that. And I said, I know the song. <laughs> I did. I said, I know the song. And I started singing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. <laughs> that's a fact. And they quickly, thank you, and they turned and, you know, remember that, Bev? They turned and headed to the car as quickly as they could. But that's the song. I mean, with grace, by grace you are saved through faith. Not of yourself, it's a gift of God. So I don't have to work for it. But when I received it, I wanted to work for him. I have a love debt to him through Jesus Christ. But that's the truth. When I, when I was reading that this week, I, I remember that experience. And like I said, they uh, uh, haven't been back. I know several years ago. But it's, it stirs Satan and the beasts to a frenzy when somebody praises the Lord. Can you imagine all the, the power when that heavenly choir turned loose, challenging the beast. Satan unleashed his greatest weapon at Calvary. Mockery and contempt and discouragement. His greatest tool that he'll use on you is discouragement. Satan is not very creative. Way back in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, he loosed his, his big three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. He still uses that on a lot of people. And he tries to condemn and discourage and defeat people. And he used mockery and contempt on Jesus. Everything that happened during the week of Passion was designed by Satan to make Jesus look foolish and weak and helpless. Let's make the king of the Jews look like a weak fool is what his plan was. The suffering was real. Pain and humiliation wasn't as harmful to him, I don't think, as was the betrayal and the rejection and the desertion of his followers. He was mocked with a Judas kiss in the garden. 
The prophecy of, of Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, was being fulfilled. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. The stone which the builders rejected. Don't be one of those that rejects him because he has become the chief cornerstone and we have to deal with him. He gave his life, gave his life. Nobody took it from him. He made his enemies look foolish. When he came out of the tomb, <laughs> hallelujah, in power and glory. When they sealed him and they thought, this is it. This is the final deal. And just to make sure, we're going to roll that stone. We're going to seal it with the, with the seal of Rome. And we're going to make sure that he stays in there. They thought it was a final deal. Pastor Pete said earlier, he only needed it for the weekend. They didn't know that. They, weren't un they didn't understand that. Here's something I just learned this week. See, I'm not too old to learn stuff. If you can teach me how to hit a 300-yard drive, I'd appreciate talking to you about God. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Maybe I shouldn't. Too, <laughs> too late. I'll mash my face all over your fist, I'll tell you that. No, that didn't come out right, did it? <laughs> But he's right, it's too late. <laughs> Here's what I learned this week. I mean, I, it's been there. I never saw it. Maybe you theologians did, I don't know. They brought the... Well, let me, let me read it to you. When they had assembled, the elders had consulted together. They gave them a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night, stole him away while we slept, and if this comes to the governor's ears, we'll appease him and make you secure. In other words, we'll cover for you. So they took the money and did as they were instructed, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Now, I've read that every time I've read the Easter story, but I never compared the large sum of money part. They gave them a large sum of money to fabricate a story. And they even said, and we'll corroborate it, we'll, we'll back you in this. If Pilate or the governor at the time uh, challenges you, we'll say, oh, no, they're telling the truth. But here's the, the, the truth that struck me this, morning, this week. It costs only change, 30 pieces of silver to betray him. That's all. But it took a large sum of money <laughs> to keep it a secret. Does that speak to you at all? That's how desperate they were that we wouldn't hear today about the resurrection. They offered a large sum of money. Doesn't say how much. That's how valuable the, the story of the resurrection is. Hallelujah. They wanted to stop the truth of the resurrection, anything to preserve their false, murderous religion. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in this public spectacle. He exposed them. And in 50 days, from the resurrection to the day of Pentecost, in 50 days, the Bible is very clear, it went from a riot to a revival. In 50 days. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued. That means clothed with power from on high. And when the Spirit comes, you'll know it. And in your life today, when the Spirit fills you, you'll know it. Hallelujah. And what comes from that is so, so powerful. 
He poured out his spirit on them and the city was filled with the news of his victory over the grave. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. A great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. This is awesome. This happened in Resurrection Sunday, triggered it and it went on for, for until today. The power of his resurrection. That's why we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We say, on Friday, we, we think about and we meditate about his death, about his trial, and we appreciate it. And we read Isaiah's prophecy, he was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was on him. With his stripes, we are healed. And we celebrate that. We celebrate the resurrection because he fulfilled all of that. And then he rose again. We can sing he breaks the power of canceled sin and sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the vilest clean. The vilest. The apostle Paul thought... He was the vilest. He said, I'm chief. I'm the chief sinner. Maybe you think you're worse than him. I don't know. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. It doesn't. Honestly, it doesn't. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin. And I love this next word, and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Clean is good. You know, I never did like a dirty car. I love to see my car clean. I think it runs better when it's clean. <laughs> a dirty mind is horrible. But let him clean it up. Clean is good. Clean feels good. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So we can stand in the victory that Christ gives us because he pulled the fangs out of the serpent. I will tell you this today before we go. He, he wants to share his victory with you. We live in an upside down world. I mean, to, 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 uh, to try to describe, it's hard for me to grasp what's happening in our society in our country and on the planet. Europe is falling. I can't understand how people can actually think like that and live like that and, and destroy their own life while they destroy dozens of other people. It's, it's too far for me, to, for me to grasp. I can't get it. I don't get it. I just knew that they, they do it because of a commitment to their religion. I do not have a religion. When you got saved, if you were an old renegade, guys at work said, hey, Joe got religion. In fact, Bazer, you, Jeff, Joe Bazer told me that my, my good friend Charlie Oliveri, he was a, he was a tough guy in Norristown. He was an enforcer. And when he got saved, he would always tell Bay, he told me this yesterday, he would always find that Bay, Joe was a cop, and Charlie would find him and say, hey, Bays, you need to get saved. You need to get saved. And, and uh, they couldn't believe Charlie Oliveri had religion. But it ain't religion. It's a relationship you develop with God through Jesus Christ. He presents you to the Father as a clean vessel. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And, and he wants to share that victory with us because we live in an upside down world. Pleasures are overrated. Treasures are underrated. The resurrection of Jesus Christ brought you freedom from sin, from guilt, from fear. 
It's valuable. They offered much money to keep it quiet because they knew how valuable it was. I want you to bow your head with me, please. Heavenly Father, we come to the close of this service on this Resurrection Sunday. And Father, if for that soul that's near eternity without Jesus, I thank you that Jackie and Charlotte knew Jesus, served him and loved him for years. And we know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we thank you for those memories. But for that one that might be here today, Lord, that needs a personal relationship with God. I'm not unaware, Father, that sometimes we have been disappointed in people that claim to know Jesus. And then we compare ourselves among ourselves. The apostle said that's not wise. But today, Father, I just pray that, that our spirits have been opened, our eyes have been opened to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And for a soul that's near eternity without Jesus, I pray for them today. While your heads are bowed for just a moment, this is an invitation. If you're here in this service and you don't know the Lord, or it's been a while since you surrendered to Him, and you'd like to leave here knowing it's well with your soul, I'm not going to beg you, but I would love to just pray for you have somebody meet you and pray with you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor Jerry, I need that. Just privately, no, no big deal. The big deal comes when you say yes to Jesus. Anyone here today on this resurrection? Thank you, brother. On this resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Would you stand with me, please? I just want us to sing a verse of a, of a, core, of a song that has brought many to Jesus. Amazing, great, not, not amazing, but just, just as I am without one plea. And this invitation is for you today. There's no condemnation in this place today, none. If you need Jesus, we're all on your side, rooting for you. But while we sing a verse of a, just as I am, if you raise your hand today or you would, wish you did, I, I just want you to step out and come to this altar and let somebody pray with you. So important. It's critical. Jesus stepped out for me publicly carry that cross that I might have life. This isn't an emotional thing. It's a real thing. You make the right choice. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Just as I am without but that Before we sing the second verse and then we're going to close, I'd like for my son David to come and Jerry maybe and Pastor Pete. And so somebody's here to, to meet you when you come. It's kind of scary to come and nobody's here. So I want you guys to, and maybe a couple ladies. I don't know who's here that needs Jesus, but I feel a strong, strong pull in my heart that this is a day of decision. No tricks. Just love today. Just as I am at waiting not 
to rid my soul one dark blot. If you, if you raised your hand or if you didn't, if you need Jesus, make your way to this altar quickly. We won't embarrass you. I am and waiting to has asked to be prayed for. Lisa, this is her last morning with us. She's going to be taking a position of worship leading and, and another fellowship. And, uh, and we want to send her away with uh, the blessing. And she asked that we just pray for her. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Lisa and her talent and her giftedness and her surrender to you. And as she leaves here, Father, to go to another place of ministry, anoint her, bless her, bless her in that church. Let them sense your presence. And Lord, as we, we send her out to be used of God, bountifully use her, we pray. And we thank you. Thank you for her life and her family. And bless and anoint what she does. In the name of Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We commission you today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. One more thing I'd like to do this morning. This is awesome. 
Isn't the presence of God something awesome? It's so wonderful. Hallelujah. I want to do that song. Is it? It's in here, right? You know, I grew up in church, and uh, I don't remember an Easter Sunday ever going by without us singing. Even when I was a little kid, I used to look forward to singing this song. I haven't heard it in a long time. But I want us to sing it together as, as we, uh, before we're dismissed. It's, uh, it's 105 in the hymn book, and once we start it, many of you might recognize it but it's called Christ Arose. How many remember that song? All right. We're going to sing it together, shall we? Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, when today. Have a wonderful day with your family. If you're going to be baptized or if there's anything to sign up for, go ahead back there and do it. If there's any food left, eat it up. And if you'd like to purchase a flower for a donation, they're up here. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Amen.